Hi guys and welcome back to the Bird Photography Show with Glenn Bartley. Hey everyone. And me, Jan Wegener. As you can see, we're not in our usual setups because Glenn has been stranded somewhere in South America, I believe. And we had planned to do a few episodes and then nothing really worked out. So we thought we'd bring you a bit more of a raw episode today, straight from the field, straight from a hotel room in Quito in Ecuador. So. That's How it. did you end up in Ecuador? Earlier in January, I traveled down to Colombia to do my annual photo workshop down there. And, and while I was there, I realized I didn't really want to risk traveling home for just a few weeks and then coming back down here. It could influence the next tour that I'd be leading. So I decided just to come straight here to Ecuador after my, my Colombia workshop. So that's where I am now. I arrived last, last night and uh, I've got, I'm going to have about three weeks to kill here between tours, but I'm sure I can find some birds in three weeks in Ecuador. Let's be honest. <laughs> well, sounds horrible being stuck in Ecuador for three weeks. I'm sure you can find some birds. And how was Colombia? Did you find some good birds for yourself and your clients? Yeah, it was amazing. You know, to be honest, after the last two years has been challenging for people who are in the, you know, the travel industry, such as myself. And this was my first tour leading since, since the start of all this. Every bird we had hoped we would find, we found, we got amazing. It was just unbelievable day after day. It's like even incredibly rare stuff like oscillated tapacula which is this like the epitome of skulky skulky birds you know you hear them in the right habitat you never see them the lot the previous one i had seen if you put your put your hands up in front of your face like that and imagine looking at a bird that's that's my best view up until now we got it hopping out onto our little perch amazing amazing things um, that we saw throughout the trip and everyone went home with hard drives and computers just full of images Sounds truly like an awful trip, hey? Um, <laughs> was, was there any other highlights or standout birds that you found there? I planned this trip to always start with an awesome opportunity with uh, one of the craziest birds, I think, in South America is this Andean cock of the rock. They do what's called lecking. So the, a bunch of males will all come to one site. And if you know where a good site is, which I do, you can just get some fantastic shots. So that was a really fun way to start the trip with something that's pretty much guaranteed and really colorful, showy bird. So everyone loves starting a trip with that. So that was a great way to start. Some years, this beautiful rainbow bearded thornbill hummingbird comes into the feeders, but this year there was none to be found. But one morning I was out early and I heard one. You know, again, we've mentioned this time and time again on the show, knowing your calls and being a really good, you know, birder in the field helps so much. So I heard a rainbow bearded thornbill calling kind of up the slope and sure enough was able to kind of lure it over for the clients and ultimately we nailed amazing shots of this little guy coming right into land on on this perch there's another bird i always see that looks like an awesome bird to photograph and also pretty challenging bird to photograph in terms of like exposure or getting a nice shot at that i know exactly which one you're going to say <laughs> I think it's called multicolor tanager. It doesn't seem like it poses very well. And then also seems to have some very bright areas, like especially on the back, for instance, that yeah. are literally blown out in every single photo I've ever seen of it. So I think you got some it's... nice shots of that guy. Maybe you can tell us how you go about photographing that and then also editing it to actually get the details out of the bird. This was a bird that we really wanted to target at our last site, or just our last few days of the trip. There's a bunch of other tanagers too. All the other tanagers are very friendly. They come in, they land on the branch, they pose, they hop over here. Maybe you want me on this branch, on this branch. This little guy, so difficult. When they come in, it's literally like they storm in, they land maybe for, and I'm not exaggerating, two seconds. And then not only do they go immediately adjacent to the banana, but they'll often just hop up on the banana that that's what we're feeding them. And then they just start eating and then they, they chow down, they chow down, they chow down, gone. By having lots of sets of eyes watching for them when they would sort of be in the area, everyone was kind of ready and the, the clients all got some really good shots. But I decided that I wanted to try to, you know, see if I could improve a little bit more. And I actually, after the tour was over, I went back to the site for two more days and I set up a bunch of treasures, set up a bunch of really good branches. It was still frustrating. So many times it would just come in. And then what was so brutal was yesterday morning before I flew here, I was just um, chatting with the owner of the site and he was just setting up for the morning, putting out some bananas and I walk over with him. We're just chatting. The thing is just sitting on the perch, just sitting there, <laughs> just like looking around, of course, no camera. As to your question, yes, the back of the bird, it's ridiculous how like glistening kind of bright yellow it is. As most of you probably know, like I, I tend to lean towards shooting aperture priority and I was having to dial in 
one and two thirds stops negative exposure compensation to not blow out. So that's an extreme example of exposure compensation for a bird. But in, in this situation, really that's what you need to do um, in the field. And I mean, that obviously makes it hard in general because then your whole scene becomes very dark. You're basically underexposing the whole rest of your image just to maintain a certain part of the bird. And so I guess you're also introducing a lot of noise in your images. Have you ever tried, for instance, it, I mean, probably doesn't work with this bird because it doesn't sit still very long, but to take like a properly exposed one and then take like a darker exposure just of the back area and then kind of blend it together or how do you go when you edit it to kind of bring it all together? Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely wouldn't be able to do like two exposures and blend them on this guy. There's no chance he's going to sit still. But what you could do is in your raw processing. Now, after, of course, you've applied our pro sets to get your colors right, obviously you're going to start with that. But after that, what you could do is do kind of like a double, a double raw process where you process one image for the overall exposure, the background, the purge, everything else. And then you do one just to hold on to those highlights. Then you layer the darker image on top of the more properly exposed image and then just mask in the detail into that back compartment of his back. So you could totally do that. But in the field, you ultimately have no choice. If you blow, if you completely blow out that patch, there's nothing you can do in post-processing to save it. So the paramount bit of information to do is as always expose to the right. You want your histogram to go almost always to all the way to the right, but not blow any critical information out. And just one more thing on that. Um, I was telling my clients a lot while we were shooting on this trip, you know, sometimes, you know, we always have that show flashing highlights on our, on our LCD. And this is really important, but what you have to remember is that that's extracting that information from the JPEG of the, of the image. Even if you're shooting raw, there's an embedded JPEG and that's what's showing to you. So even if there's like a little bit of blown out blinky, like for example, this bird has like a big triangle of, of that bright color. And if a little bit in the middle is blinking, I consider that to be the perfect exposure in the field because we know that in the raw file, we're going to be able to recover some detail. However, if the, if the patch is blown out totally to the adjacent, you know, feathers, like the green feathers adjacent to it, and you see it like blowing out right to that, you're, you're out of luck. You're not going to be able to pull that back. Or if you do pull your highlights way back, you're going to have this weird fringing kind of effect around that. So that's what I try to do in the field. I think that's a fantastic tip and definitely our pro sets will help you to get detail in those areas and even get a quite nicely balanced of all exposure and I think it's a very good tip and I do that a lot and I teach that to people a lot if you have extreme like brightness or exposure differences in your images exactly what you say do two or even three different raw files you could do one very dark one for the bright areas and then have one that has the best of all exposure but kind of blows a few areas and then bringing them all back together in Photoshop will definitely yield you the best results. And if you want to learn all about that, make sure to check out Glenn's eBooks, my masterclass, and the pro sets down there in the description, because we know they will help you tremendously to achieve amazing results with your own images. Definitely. Now, I want to tell you guys about one other really special day that we had on this Columbia trip. I looked over to my right and there was this fruiting tree with all these tiny little fruits, these sort of big clusters of these tiny little fruits. And sure enough, not one, not two, not three, four of these black-billed mountain toucans were just feeding, grabbing the little fruits, throwing them up into their bill for like half an hour. Everybody got like literally thousands of shots of these guys just chucking these fruits up and eating them, moving around, different poses, different perches. When you get birds in these natural environments and just the perfect light, the perfect background, the perfect setting, that's just, you know, what we live for. Now, Yan, you've been doing some interesting things lately. I saw your recent video, very well done video on the Z9, which we've talked about a little bit on the show, but up until, up until then we hadn't actually tried it or neither of us. So maybe you can give us a little bit of the Cliff Notes version of what you found with that camera. Well, yeah, and we were accused of bad mouthing it, I think. So <laughs> I was really keen Not me, to... not me. <laughs> So I was really keen to actually take it into the field and see how it goes and also use that 5.6500 for an extended period of time, which is that nifty little lens, obviously, that is quite, quite fun to use. And so we don't want to sound negative again. Obviously, we're nitpicking on the negative facts now because for overall, sure. it definitely caught up to the R5, R3, A1 in terms of the ability to do the eye tracking and the tracking itself. So it's 
fantastic camera overall and it really blew me away when it comes to taking video but it's mm. definitely more elaborate and time consuming to set up than basically most other cameras i've used then i don't really know if that's a negative or positive although i must say and i think a lot of people would agree that if you have a camera you turn it on you press three buttons and it works it's something that a lot of people would probably value but at the same time yeah. you can then also customizes to whichever way you want because there's so many different function buttons so i guess there's always a upside and a downside if something is very very customizable if you use the customization it's fantastic if you don't really care about it then you might miss out on something because you don't fine-tune it enough to where it could work really fantastically well for you i mean i guess the take-home message is nikon now has a camera that like is definitely capable in the field you know, this is actually kind of interesting. So on this trip that I just led, basically I had two Sony shooters, both shooting with A1s. I had one guy with a Canon R3, and then I had, um, one of the guys had an R5, myself with the R5, and two guys were still with DSLR equipment. And you really noticed the difference. This was like, you know, from just an observer, I'm often not shooting, I'm just watching people. and. The older cameras, you could just tell that people were a little bit more struggling to get the bird when it would quickly land on the perch and things like that. And you could tell that they were like, I want one of those mirrorless cameras, you know. Um, the one guy had a Z9 on order, so he's going to have his camera real soon and I'm sure he's going to enjoy it. And the other guy hadn't made the jump yet, but really realized by the end of the trip, he was shooting with a 1DX, like the newest 1DX, but he was just like, man, I got to get me one of those mirrorless cameras. So. That was quite interesting, like, you know, test to see in the field how that worked. I know you've been doing some shooting lately too, Yan. I saw some really cool video and images of, I don't know what, what pitta it is. Now I have to say the old world pittas, the pittas that are in Asia and Australia, are a little more colorful than the <laughs> South American ones. And there's definitely some stunning birds. So tell me, how did you get some great shots of that little guy? So first of all, this guy is blessed with the name Noisy pitta. <laughs> and it's called mimics like people always say it sounds like go to work. Quite an interesting call, cool little bird. And a few people reached out to me just after I got here basically saying there's this cool bird, this cool pitta hanging around. Maybe you're new to the area if you want to have a little crack at it. I'm like, yeah, of course, that's a pretty cool bird. I've never photographed one, never actually even seen a noisy pitta before. So I was very keen to go up there and there was this really long kind of fallen log and it would just often come by and just kind of hop up and down this log it was almost like its own kind of freeway through the rainforest and so you could put like a couple sort of mossy stumps or something on the log as well and the way they hop around you know they're just going to hop onto like a high point for instance so you could do a few things like that and interestingly though i started out taking a lot of images with the f4 600 millimeter lens on the r5 but then it was in so many different spots and it didn't really mind us being there so actually halfway through grabbed the second r5 with the 100 to 500 and started to use that even though it's pretty dark i had to use pretty high iso i actually got most of the images that i liked with the 100 to 500 in the end like one that's really nice in the environment and then couple of closer up shots you can see as well one with the 100 to 500 and then one with the 600 millimeter lens so overall a really cool experience i was really happy to get those shots and videos because it's just such a cool bird and a challenging environment but overall i'm pretty happy how it turned out now i saw a, i saw in one of your uh, i guess it was in your in your z9 video this bizarre looking bush turkey what was going on with that guy <laughs> It was actually the video before, I think, about the shorter wildlife lenses. But yeah, okay, that was another yeah. bird I heard about recently. And then we went to that area. So it's, well, they say it's the only one, but I've been corrected on that because some people sent me some shots of some other white brush turkeys from other areas like Townsville, for instance. So I'll take it back that it's the only white brush turkey, but it's one of the very few rare white brush turkeys. They're normally just like gray, sort of black with like a red head pretty cool birds in that particular spot you wouldn't believe where the bird actually has its nest right it's like a very touristy area and then right 
on the main roundabout in the town where all the traffic goes through between a car park and the roundabout, it has decided on a little nature strip it's going to make its little mound. So one morning, first morning I got there, I didn't really get many shots. And second day I got there, I got some cool shots of it preening. And from time to time, it actually also starts to wander down the street with all the tourists. So it's a very strange kind of bird and creature. And the third morning I thought, oh, there wasn't many other birds in the area because it's kind of in the middle of the summer here now. So most birds are in bad plumage. So I thought, oh, may as well go there again. And I got there and there was like, two females one of them was just laying an egg in the mound because with these birds oh, wow. the females just come in the morning mate with the male lay the egg and then it's all up to him basically so they just come every morning apparently for an extended period of time so they come every morning mate with the male lay a few eggs and take off again and so i was there the one morning one female was just laying an egg and he was just vigorously chasing another female around that mound and I couldn't really, it's very hard to shoot there because you basically a driveway behind you, car park here, roundabout on the yeah, other side. I was and thinking that. I was trying to make it look a bit naturey. I was thinking, should I go for like the real urban kind of look? But then it wasn't really appealing to me and it wasn't that pretty. So there was one angle when I used the 24 to 105 lens that made it look quite interesting, like a rainforest. And I really like kind of the contrast between the bright white bird and the darker kind of mm. rainforest look. And I also like how you get the male with the females in the same frame, obviously showing that contrast between the birds. The fun thing is as well, they're constantly kicking leaves and branches like towards the nest and whatever falls down, he kind of kicks up in a pile. So they built this whole nest, so they don't sit on the eggs, obviously, right? So they just put the eggs in mm. the mound and then they just control the temperature by how much stuff they put on the eggs. The contrast there is quite incredible that you can either have this bird with the people or you can kind of get more of a rainforesty feel at mm -hmm. the same time so that was something i just found quite interesting from the footage i saw you'd never know that that like i didn't know that i assumed that was like out in the bush somewhere so yeah good job making it look natural i mean this is a good example how you can control the narrative with your own work right you can yeah. choose to shoot a certain angle where it only shows that or you could also say oh this doesn't work roundabout ugly for instance i also got some really nice headshots of its preening showing the white tail and the only way to get that was to lie the r5 with the 100 to 500 on the ground because then i could have the distant trees in the background on the mm. other side of the street as my background whereas if i was just sitting at the normal height or holding it in my hand i had the roundabout with all the cars right behind the birds so just thinking about different angles different lenses really makes a big difference. That reminds me of this one time I was in Brazil and there's this beautiful tanager there, the redneck tanager, and I'm looking, looking, looking all over in the forest for it. <laughs> Go to this little Brazilian restaurant, roadside restaurant, and sure enough, there's some, there's some coming down to this little random restaurant. The feeder was in the worst possible spot for shooting and they just had like a ton of food out. So I just asked the owners, I was like, do you mind if I play around with this feeder for a bit, just for a little while? Like, yeah, no problem. I took some garbage bags, cut them open, laid it over their giant <laughs> fruit pile. I had this little piece of Tupperware that I attached to a tripod and I put like one or two bananas in there. I set up some perches. I'm literally in the parking lot of this busy Brazilian restaurant. People are coming in cars, people are all around. And I got the best shots of this redneck tanager in this like, so you never know where the shots are gonna come from. Keep your eyes open and think about how you can, as Bien says, control the narrative because ultimately you need a bird and you need a background and that could be just about anywhere. Totally, and I was happy though that I had my 100 to 5 in it with me because I could just, first of all, I was more flexible obviously, but also I could sure. still keep away enough from the tourists or blend in with the tourists enough I had taken out my yeah. 600 and a lot of people walking up and down the street I just totally. I, I just wasn't game enough to get it out in, excuse in excuse location. me do you do you shoot for National Geographic yeah. are you doing this for a magazine is that a speed are you camera? a professional yeah it just it's just never ending that's like one of the worst situations big lens in a crowded place you're not going to be uh not so going to be enjoying that. Very shoot. happy to blend in, especially with the 24 to 105, just on the camera, getting a bit closer. I just felt like I look yeah. so inconspicuous that no one would really find any offense or talk to me too much. Because, yeah, with the big gun, I just 
imagine a hundred thousand photos of me even just standing there people taking pictures of me <laughs> <laughs> totally so the other bird i know you've been chasing after lately is in your backyard those pale-headed rosellas any any luck with those guys yes and no i've set up a little feeder in my backyard they're definitely coming in it's really nice there's a lot of king parrots coming in as well which sounds nice in theory the only thing you need to know about king parrots is that they really love to destroy perches so whatever you put up they will like land on the perch, just stomp over all the greenery that's on the perch, making it break off and die, and then just kind of leave. So if you, if you set up right. something nice, the first few birds that come in is king parrots, your whole perch is ruined basically. So yeah. that's always a bit of a challenge, especially with bigger birds. Like big cockatoos are just like that as well. You set up something nice, it totally. just comes <clears throat> all gone. You have to get so lucky. That was like the same with down here, you know, if exact same thing, but in this case, it's like chachalacas or, or guans, these giant like chicken like birds, yeah. and they just come or, or jays. Yeah, you have to get someone who's really lucky when there's a bird that's only coming to the feeder every so often. You set up, of course, trying to make it look nice, but then if all these other birds come between the time you set up and then, you're not gonna get the shot yet. So you, not only does everything else have to coincide, you also have to get the bird you want to actually come to your setup within about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, if it's a busy feeder of setting up. So there's a lot that goes into getting some of these shots sometimes. Exactly, and then the only option you can do otherwise is to resort to dead perches. But for the Rosellas, I didn't really want to do that. So there's a lot of ifs. I'm working on it. I think I got some nice shots already, but especially with birds that are in your backyard, you always feel like you can do a little bit better. So I'm just kind of have taken a lot of images, sure. but haven't really edited any of them yet, but hopefully I get around to that soon. Well guys, I think that probably wraps it up for this field episode from, from the depths of Quito, Ecuador and from the tropical Queensland. Um, let us know down in the comments if you like this style of like, you know, kind of more raw, but, but real life for two professional bird photographers. What are we up to? What are, what kinds of things are we doing? We'd love to hear from you. And thanks so much for watching this episode. We'll be back in a few weeks with, I'll be traveling all around the highlands of Ecuador. I don't know what Jan will be up to. What are you going to be do up to for the next few weeks? Probably still around here because it's the rain season further north. So once that kind of fades, I will probably start traveling further north a bit. And yeah. Thanks for watching guys, like always make sure to leave us a comment, subscribe and like the video and also make sure to check out the pro sets, my masterclass and Glenn's ebook down there in the description to make sure that your bird images also look really amazing and we will see you in the next video soon. Bye guys. See you next time everybody.